guys, good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to do something a little bit different, something that I've been wanting to do for a while. I'm going to give a, a sort of summary and analysis of La Vita Nova. Those of you who've watched some of my videos recently know that I've mentioned this book a few times by Dante Alighieri, who was a 14th century Italian poet. In fact, in some ways the father of modern Italian and someone best known for his his long three-part poem called the Divine Comedy. Now he he never called it the Divine Comedy he just called it the comedy. Today we're going to be looking at his work that's a little less well known to readers in a way a more a more autobiographically rich source than the comedy though Italian uh, Dante scholars would perhaps disagree with that because they are able to draw much more out of the Divine Comedy than I am we're going to be looking at La Vita Nova which as you know from my video the other day is one of my top favorite books of all time and I'm going to do a, a, a more detailed examination of it than I've done in recent in recent videos or perhaps in any of my videos so this is going to be a little longer video I think than than hitherto for and hopefully it'll be an, an enjoyable examination now the Vita Nova or the new life or La Vita Nova the new life why did he name it that well he tells us right away in the very first sentence of the of the text now the text is part poem and part prose and the prose is mostly dedicated to analyzing the autobiographical poems that that he has in in the book now it's not a super long book I'll put the maybe I'll put the word count up on the video here for you to check out I haven't counted them yet so the very first sentence of La Vita Nova runs this way in that part of the book of my memory before the which is little that can be read there is a rubric saying incipit vita nova incipit will be begins this begins or here begins the new life you can translate that in a few different ways but I suppose it would be here begins my new life and he continues under such rubric I found I find written many things and among them the words which I propose to copy into this little book if not all of them at least their substance and then he proceeds nine times already since my birth had the heavens of light returned to the selfsame point almost as concerns its own revolution when first the glorious lady of my mind was made manifest to mine eyes even she who was called Beatrice by many who knew not whereof not wherefore not why she had already been in this life for so long as that within her time the starry heaven had moved towards the eastern quor quarter one of the twelfth parts of a degree so that she appeared to me at the beginning of her ninth year almost and I saw her almost at the end of my ninth year her dress on that day was of a most noble color subdued and goodly crimson girdled and adorned in such as best suited with her very tender age okay so that's that's a very famous opening passage and there's a few things I want to point out there there are a couple of nine-year-olds and nine is I mean Dante's big into numbers and he points to nine in this in this case in this passage numbers are going to come up again especially towards the end of the book as Dante tries to make sense of of his life now this is something that needs to be pointed out right away how Dante views the world this none of this stuff is accidental Dante will either impress you or dismay you by the degree to which he imputes significance to things that probably many of us many of us modern people um, living in a secular world wouldn't impute such significance I, I don't know if I would say that he's typical of his time but he's not unusual for his time in finding significance in all these things that we might say are 
insignificant. Now the rotation of the heavens, I mean, we, we talk about birthdays and all that stuff. Some people believe in uh, astrology, but it's not a very wide, widely held belief in our modern times. Whereas in his, in his day and age, it was more widely held, even though astrology per se was condemned by the Catholic Church. You know, as far back as in St. Augustine's time, because before he became a Christian, Augustine was big into astrology, and uh, he wrote some pretty significant works about against astrology. But nevertheless, I mean, read uh, C.S. Lewis's The Discarded Image if you would like to see how significant these blending of different traditions, I'd say this pagan tradition of, of astrology with Christian with Christian doctrine. And I suppose in a way, nothing exhibits this intersection better than the Divine Comedy itself, especially the Paradiso. But all parts of the Divine Comedy are carefully structured around the movements of the planets and the stars. So Dante is very careful in telling you the different times and places. The Divine Comedy itself, if I remember accurately, takes place over uh, the Holy Easter Tridium, the three the three sacred days, or I say the most sacred days of the Christian year that run from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. So it's significant that the Divine Comedy, Dante's journey through hell, purgatory, and heaven, takes place over that period of time. He's, he's uniting his, his spiritual journey with Jesus's passion, death, and resurrection. And we see the same thing here in La Vita Nova, the new life. Now, yeah, it should be asked at this point, how can a new, how can a life begin at nine years old? When we look at nine-year-olds today, we see people who, I suppose, according to Christian theology, they are of the age of reason now. That's an important milestone in Christian anthropology. And that's why, uh, for instance, children who are about seven years of age can re start receiving their first holy, their receiving Holy Communion. Uh, unlike the Eastern Orthodox Church, which administers it at, at infancy, the East, the Western Catholic Church sees the age of reason as the, as the proper time for that. And at the age of reason, Christian children can begin to take more of a personal responsibility for their religious practice and can start to do things like fast on on the feet on the fast days and and so on there's some kind of connection here with the nine you know dante likes the number nine and mathematically it's a pretty cool number you know three to the power of three but to us of course it looks like a weird thing like two like a child falling in love with another child but none of this stuff is accidental everything's laden with deep meaning I can't in, in one little video expose all the meaning, and I'm certainly not aware of all the meaning, so even if I had an infinite number of amount of time, I wouldn't be able to do that. There's a beginning here. Dante's life as a Christian, as a lover, and as a, as a poet are beginning here. Something happens in his seeing of Beatrice. And again, if I could point back to C.S. Lewis again, the Christian view of romantic love is special, and it's nowhere exemplified better than in Dante. Dante's the part of a tradition, a romantic tradition, that's uniquely Christian, and we can see it here if we look if we look carefully enough. A little further on, Dante says, you know, he, he then sort of describes the significance of this encounter with Beatrice, and then he says, from that time forward, love quite governed my soul. Okay, so that is the beginning. That's the new life. From that time forward, love governed my soul. Okay, that means everything. Then, musing on what I had seen, I proposed to relate the same to many poets who were famous in that day. And for that, I had myself, in some sort, the art of discoursing with rhyme. I resolved on making a sonnet in the which, having saluted, all who are all, all such people who are subject to love and entreated them to expound my vision i should write unto them those things which i which i had seen in my sleep 
and the sonnet I made was this, and it begins, To every heart which the sweet pain doth move. After that, after the, the sonnet is given, Dante then explains it. He breaks it up into its different parts, and he describes the meaning of these parts. So he's not just giving a history here. He's teaching lessons in poetry. He's teaching how to write a poem, and he's teaching how to interpret a poem. He is ultimately showing that the poems are the best re reflection of his life. And further on, he says, And now, resuming my discourse, I will go on to relate that when, for the first time, this beatitude was denied me, I became possessed with such grief that, parting myself from, un from others, I went into a lonely place to bathe the ground with most bitter tears. And when, by this heat of weeping, I was somewhat relieved, I betook myself to my chamber, where I could lament unheard, and there, having prayed to the Lady of all mercies, and having said also, O love, aid thou thy servant, I went suddenly asleep like a beaten, sobbing child, and in my sleep, towards the middle of it, I seemed to see in the room, seated at my side, a youth in very white raiment, who kept his eyes fixed on me in deep thought. And when he had gazed some time, I thought that he had sighed and called to me in these words. And then he has the Latin, Fili mi tempus estot preminenter simulata nostra. Uh, I'll put in the translation here if I, if I think of it. Anyway, further on he goes, But as soon as I had thus resolved, I began to feel a faintness and a throbbing at my left side, which soon took possession of my full body. I have to tell you, this is a bit further on. Whereupon I remembered that I had covertly leaned my back onto a painting that ran the walls of the house, and being fearful lest my trembling should discern of them, should be discerned of them, or by them, I lifted my eyes to look on those ladies, and when first perceived, and then first perceived among them the excellent Beatrice, and when I perceived her, all my senses were overpowered by the great lordship that love obtained finding himself so near unto that most gracious being until nothing but the spirits of sight remained to me and even these remained driven out of their own instruments because love entered in that honored place of theirs that so he might the better behold her okay a bit further on he goes a few days after this my body became afflicted with a painful infirmity whereby it suffered bitter anguish for many days and he goes on to describe that then he goes on a little later, I mean, he has, he sort of has a vision in his sickness and he goes, he said within, I said within myself, certainly it must someday come to pass that the very gentle Beatrice will die. And then he talks about that and the effect of that. And further on he goes, then by the words, the strong imagination was suddenly brought to an end. At the moment that I was about to say, O Beatrice, peace be with thee. And already I had said, O Beatrice. When being aroused, I opened mine eyes and knew that it had been a deception. But albeit I had indeed uttered her name, yet my voice was so broken with sobs that it was not understood by these ladies, so that in spite of the sore shame that I, that I felt, I turned towards them by love's counseling, and they beheld me. So he goes on, describes that, and then he goes on uh, and recounts another poem. And a little bit later on, he goes, okay, so, so here's an interesting thing. He goes, then goes on and says, it might be here objected to me that I've spoken of love as though it were a thing outward and visible, not only, in its, not only a spiritual essence, but as a bodily substance, love not being of itself a substance, but an accident of a substance. Yet that I speak of love as though it were a thing tangible and even human appears by three things which I have said. Okay, so he goes on to explain that, and this is very Thomistic or Aristotelian language, this uh, substance and accidents thing. So a little bit later he goes on, I was still occupied with this poem, having composed thereof only the above written stanza, when the Lord God of Justice called my most gracious lady unto himself, that she might be glorious under the banner of that blessed Queen Mary, whose name has, has always a deep reverence in the words of the Holy Beatrice. And because haply it might be found good that I should say somewhat concerning her departure, 
I will herein declare what are the reasons which make that I shall not do so. Okay, so he's talking about Beatrice's death, and he goes on. Nevertheless, as the number nine, which number hath often had mention in what hath gone before, seems also to have borne a part in the manner of her death. And he says that her the timing of her death was significant as well, according to the number nine. And then he goes on. When my, when my eyes had wept for some while, and they were so weary with weeping that I could no longer through them, uh, use them to, to ease my sorrow, I thought that a few mournful words might, might, you know, be better instead of crying. And so he made it, he made, he wrote a poem. He says that I might speak therein of her for whom so much sorrow had destroyed my spirit. And then I began, and he says the first, and the first line of the, of the poem is the eyes that weep. Okay. So he says, but against this adversary of reason, there rose up, rose up in me on a certain day about the ninth hour a strong visible fantasy wherein i seemed to behold the most gracious beatrice habited in that crimson ra raiment which she had worn when i first beheld her also she appeared to me the same tender age as then okay and then he talks about thinking of her and memory of her and all that and my heart began painfully to repent of the desire by which it had so basely let itself be possessed during so many days contrary to the constancy of reason now i'm not sure here but i but this this little passage stood out to me and it's kind of a reminder of what happens in the purgatory and if i'm not i have a hunch here though i'm no expert but when dante to get into heaven dante who's not worthy he has to pass through the the river Lethe, which eradicates takes away your memory so i think in this case it's the memory of his sin and i think we're talking about sexual sin here i think we're talking about him sexually desiring another woman or something um and i think he's upbraided for that by beatrice in the divine comedy if i remember correctly and he goes on and then this evil desire being quite gone from me all my thoughts turned again unto the excellent beatrice and i say most truly that from that hour I thought constantly of her with the whole humbled and ashamed heart, the which became often manifest in sighs. I said, woe's me, because I was ashamed of the trifling of my eyes. This sonnet I do not divide, since its purpose is manifest enough. And then he recounts the sonnet. And then he goes on later. After writing the sonnet, it was given to me to behold a wonderful vision, wherein I saw things which determined me that I would say nothing further of this most blessed one until such time as I could discourse more worthily concerning her. And to this end, I labor all I can, as, sh as she well knows. Wherefore, if it be his pleasure through whom is the life of all things, that my life continue with me a few years, it is my hope that I shall write concerning her what has not been written of any other woman. After that, May it seem good to him who is the master of grace that my spirit should go hence to behold the glory of its lady, to wit, of that blessed Beatrice who now looks continuously on his holy countenance, qui est per omnia secula benedictus laus deo, laus deo who is um, blessed through all ages. Praise God. Um, okay, so, you know, those few excerpts that I've made from La Vita Nova, we have kind of a, a synopsis of Dante's life, at least the important parts of it, according to him. What's interesting is as much what he says as what he doesn't say. He doesn't tell us anything about getting married or having children. He doesn't tell us about his, the political events of his life, how he had to leave his beloved city of Florence because he was in the wrong political party and he spent the rest of his life in exile. Um, he doesn't tell us any of that. That's not, that's not of utmost importance. We can learn a bit more probably from La Vita Nova if we think of a few other works that help frame Dante's thinking. For as much as a pioneer Dante was, and in, in some ways 
La Vita Nova is a truly original work, and in some ways the Divine, the Divine Comedy is truly original work too, but in some ways they have precursors. And perhaps two of the best precursors of La Vita Nova are Augustine's Confessions, which was written in the, uh, at the, basically at the end of the 4th century, 397, and the Consolation of Philosophy by the Christian philosopher Boethius, which was composed in the 6th century. Um, let me speak of Augustine's Confessions first. And I'm thinking of it mainly because it is so similar in many ways. It's a much longer work, and it's a biography, or sorry, it's an autobiography. Augustine wrote primarily in prose, although some scholars say that there are poetic sections. And the Confessions is Augustine's story of his conversion from one kind of life to another. It's a conversion from a bad to a better kind of life. And the Confessions is interesting to us today for as much as what it doesn't say as to what it does say. Augustine omits a lot of information that we as interested readers today would love to know. For instance, Augustine doesn't tell us the name of the woman that he loved and lived with for many years and fathered a son with. And just like Dante doesn't tell us the name of his wife. And Dante was married and had children, but not with Beatrice. Um, and later on, I said uh, about a century or so after Augustine, Boethius wrote, and his Consolation of Philosophy is, is like Confessions in many ways, and is like La Vita Nova in many ways. De Boethius was basically in prison waiting to be executed, uh, being executed for uh, treason. He didn't do anything treasonous, but such is life, uh, like Socrates, I suppose. Boethius talks about his encounter with philosophy, lady philosophy, in terms very, very, in, in ways very reminiscent of, of Dante. With Dante, you're not sure what's going on. Sometimes it's presented as a vision, sometimes a dream, sometimes it's, it's, he seems to be speaking allegorically, like he doesn't, he's not talking about something he's actually seeing, but he's trying to describe a truth allegorically. And it's the same with uh, Boethius. And I suppose in a way you could say the same thing with Augustine. Augustine records a few mystical experiences in his confessions. He talks about hearing a voice and he talks about a vision that he and his mother experienced. So Augustine wasn't one for talking too much about the mystical. To him, the greater truths were intellectual truths, not truths of, of sight and, and of astonishing uh, cures and miracles and so on. And I suppose that's the case for Boethius as well, whose description of Lady Philosophy is very allegorical. Whereas Dante is so wrapped up in the visual and in the emotive that you don't know, it doesn't seem like he's, he's treating these things as mere metaphors. I think it's fair to say that he really believes he's seen, he's seen things. And to him, a dream is no different than a waking vision. These things are as real to him. He does tell us at one point that his idea of love, and love for him is a male, not a female, which, which is interesting. He says that when he speaks of love in this way, he's speaking metaphorically. But when he sees Beatrice, he actually sees her. So one time it looks like he's having a, a, a fever dream. So he's, he's very ill. And he has a vision of Beatrice and he hears things about Beatrice's death. So the distinctions between visions and ideas and dreams and aspirations, these are not hard, hard and fast cut things. And I think that, that I should point out something um, more general here, which unites Boethius, Augustine and Dante. And that is the very Christian idea that life has meaning. And not only does it have meaning, but it has a historical progression. That it's not just history that has meaning, which it does. History is the history of salvation. It is a religious story. It has a beginning, it has a middle and an end. 
Its center point, of course, is the death and resurrection of Jesus, in which all people can take part through baptism and through their own deaths. And in each case, in Augustine's case, in Boethius's, and in Dante's case, the, the events of their lives are also significant. Everything that happens has a significance, and it's important to be aware that God is always talking to you. So let that one sink in for a few minutes. It's important for every Christian to realize that God is always speaking to you. What's unique in Dante's case and distinguishes Dante from Boethius and Augustine is the way in which Dante unites love of a woman with love of God. Augustine saw the two opposed. He couldn't love God until he conquered his desire for women. And he had to send his, what we, I suppose we call common law wife, he had to send her away before he could be a real Christian. And in the ancient church, real Christians were celibate. It was, it was hard to make a distinction between a celibate and a Christian. And this is why, you know, a few generations later, even Boethius, there's nothing sexual about lady philosophy, okay? She may be beautiful, but her beauty is truth. Dante is the heir of a new tradition that, again, I'll refer back to C.S. Lewis and his, his, uh, his book on on love and the, the, the allegory of love. Let's look at it for a second here in this sense. Is what Dante doing heretical? Or does it follow from, from the presuppositions that what happens to you in your life is meaningful, has significance, is part of God's communication? Well, his encounter with Beatrice was a part of his life, the most striking part of Dante's life, as was his gift and love for poetry. So Beatrice becomes very much in the heart of his Christian life. And if you want to further study how that's possible, you have to read the Divine Comedy then. So Beatrice is the one who takes over after the pagan Virgil. Virgil can take him through, can take Dante through hell, but he can't go beyond that because he's, he wasn't baptized. So after that, Another po another Christian poet takes over, and Beatrice is involved the whole time in ushering and helping Dante get to heaven, and so is Saint Lucy, who is someone for whom Dante, uh, Dante himself had had great reverence in his life. So he prayed a lot to Saint Lucy. So in a way, Saint Lucy owed him. But as I said before, in a pivotal moment, there has to be the love has to be purified. Dante's sexual relationship with his wife, curiously, plays no role in Dante's spiritual journey, not in La Vita Nova and not in the Divine Comedy. He doesn't mention her. He doesn't even, I believe, he doesn't even mention his own children. Beatrice plays a necessary role because his love for her isn't sexual. It's spiritual. It's not sexual. It's a love of beauty. I mean, a modern person would have a hard time making a distinction between a love of beauty and sexual love but Dante seems to depend on the distinction so I really hope that I've been able to give a bit of a background a bit of why I appreciate and like La Vita Nova so much I feel like yeah there's lots that I didn't say but hopefully I've pointed out some important parts about this poem and it is beautiful it's wonderful and I hope that you will read it and if you have any questions you can enter them in at the in on this video comments and uh, and I'll see if I can answer them I don't know anyway I hope you enjoyed that and we'll talk to you guys real soon again thank you so much